I am Dwayne Brown. Tonight on KPBS Evening Edition, the battle over the city's pension reform heats up again. And San Diego doctors join the fight against prescription drug abuse. We'll tell you about a new network to keep pills out of the wrong hands. I'm Anita Sharma. Freeway guardrails are supposed to keep us safe in a crash, but a small design change could be leading to serious injuries and even death. We'll tell you about the investigation. And a San Diego professor turns his research into a play about cancer. We'll have a preview. Some University City fourth graders are test driving a video game to learn the basics of computer programming. KPBS Evening Edition starts now. KPBS Evening Edition is made possible by Joan and Irwin Jacobs and by Hi, good evening. Thanks for joining us. Mayor Bob Filder says it's time to pull the plug on a lawsuit over San Diego's pension system. City Attorney Jan Goldsmith filed the suit nearly three years ago over how much city workers should pay into their pensions. Filner says since the city is in charge of legal counsel for the pension system, the suit amounts to the city suing itself. Enough is enough. I urge the city attorney and the city council to take swift action toward dropping this case and to do so immediately. The mayor says the cost has reached more than $3 million. The suit goes to court next month unless the city attorney changes his mind. A state attorney says the mayor doesn't have authority to veto port commission appointees. Filner vetoed two objecting to city council's appointment procedure, but the port district was created under state authority, so Filner cannot act on those appointments. The city attorney says the new commissioner should be certified and sworn in. The wife of former CIA director David Petraeus made a stop at Camp Pendleton today. Holly Petraeus is a consumer advocate for service members. She says young military families are often victims of predatory lenders. She says money problems are a burden and can jeopardize military careers. Financial problems are now the number one cause of security clearances being revoked. She met with Marines and their spouses to hear about their financial struggles. Petraeus plans to share the information with leaders in Washington. A new congressional bill would amend the federal ban on marijuana for medical use, so those who obey state laws would be immune from federal prosecution. California is one of 18 states with medical marijuana laws. San Diego doctors are joining the fight against prescription drug abuse. KPBS reporter Susan Murphy tells us more than 100 have joined a statewide network to curb the problem. More people in San Diego are dying of prescription drug overdoses than from car crashes, homicides, and suicides. Prescription drug-related fatalities increased 27 percent over the last five years. Ranit Lev is chairman of the Prescription Drug Abuse Medical Task Force and an emergency physician at Scripps Mercy Hospital. She says not all overdoses stem from abuse. Many are accidental. Some people take so many different medications that they eventually succumb. In California, we prescribe 6.2 kilograms of pain pills per 10,000 of population which is enough to medicate every single American round the clock for a month. Lev says an average of one San Diegan per day dies from a drug overdose. That's why San Diego physicians are encouraged to register to the state's drug monitoring database called the Controlled Substance Utilization Review and Evaluation System, or CURES. Thomas Lennox is supervisory special agent of the Drug Enforcement Administration. He says the more doctors who register, the healthier the community will be. Because when a physician sees that there's an abusive pattern or an addictive pattern, uh, they will be able to refer those patients into some type of a treatment program and uh, they're going to actually be treating them for uh, one of the uh, issues that they have, which is addiction. They may have an underlying health issue, that needs to be looked at also. The Cures database contains more than 100 million entries of controlled substance drugs that were dispensed in California. Susan Murphy, KPBS News. 
Those guardrails on freeways are supposed to protect us from severe injury during a crash, but in San Diego and across the country, guardrails with a modified design may actually be causing fatalities. KPBS reporter Amitha Sharma explains. This week, an investigation by our partners at 10 News found that some guardrails on San Diego freeways may be responsible for serious injuries to drivers and passengers, all because of one small design change. 10 News investigative reporter Mitch Blocker looked into the story. Here's a brief clip from his report. From the shoulder of the 805, Harmon showed us the model that was approved by the government in 2000, one with a 5-inch head. He says in 2005, the manufacturer, Trinity Industries, redesigned its guardrails, making them smaller and using less material to build them. This is the aftermath of a crash in Tennessee. Harmon says these pictures show what can happen to a 4-inch guardrail in a head-on collision. The rail detaches from the head, Harmon says, and can impale a car and its driver. So, Mitch, how common are these newer 4-inch head guardrails in San Diego County? We found a few more than a dozen, about 14, on San Diego roads, all the way from the 78 to the 5 to the 805. Uh, to the 15, there's some on the 8 as well. Um, they're, they're fairly common. They are in every state in the country, and they're in 60 countries internationally. How can a one-inch design change mm -hmm. make such a difference to the safety of drivers on freeways? Well, that one inch is just the, the weld on the head of the guardrail, and it actually makes the, the dimensions f much smaller. So you're talking about about 87 pounds of material that's no longer on a 4-inch guardrail uh, that was in a 5-inch guardrail. And did regulators, did the, f the Federal Highway Administration approve this design change? They did, but they approved it based on specifications that never said anything about the fact that the, that the company that made this guardrail was going from a 5-inch railhead to a 4-inch railhead. So they didn't have that design specification. And what about Caltrans? Did Caltrans have that information? Cal Caltrans takes its lead based off the Federal Highway Administration, as do state departments of transportation all across the country. So if the Federal Highway Administration approves something, says it's okay, uh, the state departments of transportation usually uh, go off that lead. Some state departments of transportation have higher standards, and they, they go by those as well. But not only uh, was the, the, this federally approved, but it's also federally paid for. Okay, Trinity Industries makes these guardrails. Mm -hmm. They made the design change. Did they not inform federal regulators about the design change? That is, if there, if there is any smoking gun, if you will, in this entire story, it's the fact that Trinity Industries admits that they omitted the fact that in 2005 they went from making a 5-inch uh, guardrail head to a 4-inch guardrail head. So when the Federal Highway Administration approved the new design, they approved it without ever knowing that that one inch difference existed. And what are the consequences for that? Well, there are lawsuits and allegations from, from this whistleblower who you saw in the clip um, that it's a world of difference. It, it is the difference in some cases between life and death that the four inch guardrail head is simply not sus substantial enough. It doesn't have a, enough heft in order to uh, keep the head, the flat head, uh, which is a, a blunt, on on the guardrail when a collision occurs. And what happens, uh, at least in the allegations, is that the guardrail head falls off and it creates a spear with the rest of the guardrail. You saw in that picture uh, that can go through the passenger cabin all the way through the taillights. And tell me about this whistleblower you spoke to. What's mm -hmm. his story? His name is Joshua Harmon. He is a competitor of Trinity Industries, a guardrail manufacturer who's based in Virginia. Now, he has, he has quite a story. He's involved in litigation with, with Trinity. They have sued him for defamation based on what he is saying. He is driving the country looking for these four-inch guardrail heads. And this originally started because he tried to copy the design for the four-inch guardrail, thinking his lawyers thought he thought that the patents had expired. They had not. So this originally started because he re-engineered, he, he reverse-engineered uh, the four-inch Trinity guardrail. Trinity sued him to stop doing that, but he says based on what he found when he did that, he couldn't ignore 
uh, what, what he thought was an unsafe product. So what happens next with these lawsuits? I mean, who, who has to step in and correct the situation? A great question. Um, at this point, the Federal Highway Administration is, is somewhat distancing itself from this, saying, well, we approved it in 2005 and we stand by that approval. The lawsuits have to work themselves out in uh, state and federal court. At this point, there's no court decision pointing to whether or not these guardrails are safe or are dangerous. At this point, it's all allegations. Um, Trinity Industries says that their product is safe and they stand by it. Uh, guys like Joshua Harmon and some of those people who claim that they were injured um, or, or had loved ones killed in accidents because of this guardrail say otherwise. I'm Mitch Blocker, thank you for a very good report. Thank you for having me. This spring marks the first year middle and high school history classes around the country are required to teach students about what happened on September 11, 2001. Now the 912 Generation Project hopes to turn a symbol of the tragedy into a teaching tool. What once was tattered and torn has become a living testament to the resilience and compassion of the American people. In the days after 9-11, this flag hung from a building directly south from where the World Trade Center stood. The flag was removed and stitched back together seven years later by survivors of tornadoes and many other disasters across the country. So when we actually took it out of the bag in 2008, you could still smell the smoke for about a year. Jeff Parnas was on a mission to commemorate the generosity people from across the country extended to New Yorkers and became the custodian for the national 9-11 flag. We were exceptionally honored last Flag Day to have been donated three threads from the original Star Spangled Banner that flew at Fort McHenry and inspired the national anthem. It's inspired more than just patriotism during tours of 50 states. It's also created a renewed sense of service and volunteerism with a goal to inspire one and a half million kids to do something to help others. They brought the flag to the National School Board's association meeting in San Diego in hopes of growing the project. Our goal with this national conference is to go national uh, so that educators know that this is a solution for them, that it's a safe way and a positive way to talk to kids about 9-11, but get them active in service projects focused on you know, the beauty and, and the compassion that happened on 9-12. It comes at a time middle and high school history classes are now required to teach about 9-11, Fire Captain Eric Abney is the flag escort who survived Hurricane Katrina in Louisiana. He says there's a common thread, and the flag is a symbol of something much bigger. And then what you see behind you is what this country put back together, stitch by stitch. And it was just common, everyday people who got to pull a needle and thread. And if we can take one little thing back to help rebuild our country, and it came from something that was so devastating to everybody. The national 9-11 flag will be on public display through Sunday at the Hilton Bayfront downtown next to the San Diego Convention Center. There's a movement across the country to give students more hands-on experience with science and technology. Some fourth graders from University City are test driving a video game teaching the basics of computer programming. KPBS education reporter Kyla Calvert has this report. Nine-year-old Jade Climo says she's enjoying her second chance to play a game called Code Spells. I think that's fun to give spells and be chased by monsters and levitate and stuff. In addition to escaping monsters and floating, she and her partner Amelia Atwell are using the game's spells to complete the challenges set before them, like delivering a package to a house on the other side of a river. We're going to go into the spell book, which is right at the top. And then we find teleportation and we click on copy. And so it's down in our inventory. And then to teleport, we just put the spell on the other side of the river. But Sarah Esper, one of the UC San Diego computer science PhD students who developed the free game, says they're also learning about the basic building blocks behind many websites and computer programs. All the spells are actual Java code, so that's one of the biggest components of code spells, is we're using an industry standard language, and it's often the language first taught at an undergraduate curriculum. Esper says she and her design partner wanted to take the frustration out of the early stages of learning to program. Because you have this computer telling, me, telling you, no, you're wrong, no, you're wrong, no, 
know you're wrong. Um, and in video games, though, you don't have that. You're constantly dying and failing, but you keep trying and keep trying. Students start out copying spells, but then can make changes to the code or write their own. Kyla Calvert, KPBS News. We have two plays to tell you about on two completely different topics. One serious, the other not so much. Peggy Pico gets us started with one man's unusual and personal play about cancer. It's simply called The Cancer Play, and it includes real-life, intimate conversations with cancer patients and their families. The play is based on the research of Wayne Beach, a professor of communication at SDSU. The Cancer Play will have three performances at San Diego Lyceum Theater this weekend. They are free and open to the public. Professor Beach, thank you so much for coming ahead of time and talking to us about, these, uh, about this play. Thanks for having me. Now, The Cancer Play is about how people react to and talk with their family members who have cancer. How did this come about? A family in San Diego donated uh, me a set of materials uh, and asked that I work on them if I wanted to. And I sat on them for eight years for various reasons and then um, decided to get to work on them after my own mother was diagnosed and, and died with cancer. And it became personal in this research. You, you actually had recordings of your mother's and, and, and recordings of other people with the, uh, these conversations? No recordings of my mother, but the recordings in the in the, uh, that the family donated me in San Diego in, included 61 phone calls over 13 months. And it turned out to be the first natural history ever of a family talking through cancer on the telephone from diagnosis through death of a loved one. And people will hear some of these conversations as through actors? All the dialogue in the play, which is about 78 minutes long, um, is made up of these family phone calls. A lot of people may remember I had cancer. I was diagnosed with stage three in 2011. Um, I talked publicly about it. That felt really pretty good. What surprised me as a cancer patient was talking to people on a one-to-one -one level personally, uh, survivors, uh, people who were going through it, really had an emotional impact on me and, and still does to this day. Is that consistent with what you found going through these conversations? Yeah, the stereotype publicly is cancer is a devil term, not a God term. It's, uh, it's the number one public health fear, um, and it's uh, extremely threatening for various reasons and various good reasons. But what I was struck with on the family phone call conversations is that uh, it's not about, even though the mother eventually uh, dies of cancer, it's really not focusing that much on death. It's focusing on hope. And it's focusing on the family coming together to support and to comfort one another and to make important uh, discerning decisions over the course of this journey. And so the stuff of hope turns out to be much more powerful than the stuff of despair. And some oncology nurses here in San Diego agreed with that, correct? I've shown clips to oncology nurses here through uh, scripts and also the Orange County Oncology Nurses Association and, and, uh, and in larger discussions of what makes up hope, yes. Well, I'm two years out from my cancer diagnosis. I'm cancer-free, happy to say. But people still approach me and they'll whisper when they say the word cancer. They'll say, oh, I have a friend who has cancer. You know, as if that's, it's going to startle me uh, somehow. I'm wondering, how do you reassure audience members that going to see something called the cancer play won't bring them to tears, won't depress them, they won't walk away being down, and instead it'll be that hope message that you talked about? Well, three quarters of all the audience members that have seen it have described it as uplifting, and less than 10% of the audience members have described it as too depressing. It turns out that conversations are the source of strength and resilience and that bad news does give rise to good news and almost 60 percent now of people diagnosed with cancer do not die of cancer but are survivors and it turns out that the families uh, going through this in your friendship and work networks they endure forever so in your own cancer journey it's probably very much the case that if you reflect back it's the conversations that really helped uh, get you heal up and put put you into remission uh, and that's the way that's the power of the language absolutely even in in recovery and even recovering people who have been through it you feel like you're in this special little club that has their own little language as you said now you plan to video record Sunday night's performance um, how come 
It's part of a study funded by the National Cancer Institute. And uh, last time we did three live performances at Scripps Mercy Hospital and took a DVD of that to Denver to show to three different cancer centers. This time the study protocol funded by the National Cancer Institute is to generate a uh, videography of the play on Sunday and then that will be screened in San Diego, Salt Lake City, Lincoln, Nebraska, and Boston uh, beginning August. So it goes across the United States, what we call an effectiveness in a dissemination trial to see how more diverse audiences respond to it. See how it responds. Well, certainly we get the first look at it here this weekend. I want to let people know that performances of the cancer play will be held this weekend at San Diego Lyceum Theater. Reservations are required, but it is free. For more information, go to our website, kpbs.org. Org. Professor Wayne Beach, thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you. Last night, we introduced you to the San Diego Derby Dolls, who've actually inspired another type of play. KPBS arts reporter Beth Accomando takes us behind the scenes of Derby Wise. When Circle Circle Dot Dot's Katherine Haroff tackles a new play, she tries not to have any preconceived ideas about the community she's trying to depict. But when the community is women's roller derby, she found a lot of stereotypes out there. What I found out is that in the media they highlight the cutesy parts of derby, that it is women and they dress up and the media likes to showcase these girls in a way that I don't think that they see themselves. Haroff saw them as something of superheroes in an alternative universe and that's reflected in the scenic design of her new play, Derby Wise. I wanted to transport the audience right when they step into this theater and just see this world and sort of get transported into this fantasy world that is roller derby. It's like they create an, a new sort of family in this world and they all do have different names and in order to tell this story in an entertaining way and also sort of capture the action in it, we created this sort of graphic novel that is the set. I play Jane, and my derby name is the Iron Maiden. I'm the one that kind of gets all the girls together. Wow, we have some different levels of experience here, don't we? I play Erica, or Jezebel, in the derby world. She's an independent woman who's always happy to volunteer because she loves derby so much, and she wants to go in and make her team the best that it can be, but unfortunately lets her ego get in the way. We don't have to be friends, Grace. I'm here to play, not to make new girlfriends for slumber parties. I'm here to revolutionize the sport and be good at it. She's kind of getting a little too big for her britches, so there's kind of the dynamic of watching her kind of blossom, but not in the best way. Or maybe it's in a good way. Maybe she learns her lesson. For the San Diego Derby Dolls, it's not just about being a good athlete, but rather about learning to let go of your ego to become a successful teammate. The story is very much about, you know, conflict and how we resolve them. And, and some people deal with them and grow up and become better people. And some people take off and can't deal with it. Why are you making it like this, Erica? Why are you? Things were fine before we had to talk about our feelings every time someone got hurt emotionally. I mean, do you think the Chargers sit in an office with their manager every time one hurts another? Oh. We're not the Chargers. We are an all-female derby team. We are different, and we have to deal with our problems in every possible way so that we can grow. They take the time to make sure that when there's a problem, when girls are angry at each other, that they have to deal with it or they don't get to play. They have to talk it out and work it out and at least leave that feeling better about it and feeling like they came to a resolution or, or they can't be a team. And I found that they face everything head on. And all of that is a true part of what we do. But at the same time, you're sitting there watching going, we're not like that. That's not, I'm not like that. It's based on a real situation. So you want to make sure that you're doing the stories of these real people justice. Bonnie Destroyer was founder of the San Diego Derby Dolls and had a chance to see Derby Wise with some of her teammates. I thought Derby Wise was great. I think they really made an effort to pay attention to detail and to get a lot of our culture involved in the play. And they obviously are a community, like we're a community with tons of passion, like we have tons of passion. That passion pushes you to do the things that you want to do. You kind of get bit by this bug, like, oh my gosh, I have to do this, I want to do this, and I'm so scared and excited all at the same time I really want to do this. Something is just unhinged me about this game. It's part torture, part obsession for me now. Hey, I get it. 
I mean, we got the derby bug. It turns out over time, I didn't realize that it was also helping me become a, a much more well-formed woman. Derby Wise gives us an ensemble of female characters who start a little rough around the edges, but through conflict and adversity, manage to polish up quite nicely. And that's a different take than you usually get on women's roller derby. Beth Accomando, KPBS News. And Derby Wise runs through April 27th at the 10th Avenue Theater. I'm Judy Woodruff on the next News Hour. Could a new way to watch TV online be the end of traditional airwaves? That's Friday on the PBS News Hour. San Diego weather forecasts cooler and cloudy along the coast this weekend. With a mix of sun and clouds inland, highs mostly in the upper 60s, the mountains will see some sunshine, a wind advisory for the deserts with plenty of sun for the weekend. Tonight in the public square, your thoughts about the grounding of the Blue Angels. Earlier this week, we told you about the decision to cancel all of the squad's remaining shows for this year because of sequestration. One of the canceled appearances was at the Miramar Air Show, but the air show will still go on. While the Marine Corps and the Blue Angels are disappointed, we got a different take from some of you. On Facebook, Barbara Wingate says talented pilots shouldn't be wasted in entertainment, writing, stop wasting fuel and professional time spent in dangerous displays of aeronautical lunacy. And University City resident Mary Maisel says, I will be delighted if the Miramar Air Show is canceled, a week full of loud noises that scare pets and people. She says canceling the Blue Angels is easily a great benefit of sequester. So what do you think? Follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, and of course, you can email us. You can find tonight's stories and download the KPBS app all on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. Have a great weekend.